the yes. Okay. And as I say, if we get a note to the comms team and whatever, just to, just in the background, say this is what's going on. All right. Yep. I will do that now. Okay. We're recording now. Thank you. Uh, I will continue as if it was a public meeting. So. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome you to this meeting uh, of the Business Board, and I'm pleased to welcome members of the press and the public who are able to join this virtual meeting online or view it on the recording later. If members experience any technical difficulties during the meeting, please refresh your connection in the first instance. If it becomes apparent that we have lost members and are no longer core it, it may be necessary to adjourn the meeting. Thank you. So uh, welcome uh, everybody. I will begin by calling out the names of all the members of the business board in alphabetical order to establish their presence for the record. Uh, Vic Annals. Present. Uh, Belinda Clark. I'm here, Mike. Uh, Mayor Dr. Nick Johnson. Present. Thank you. Amir Khalid. I haven't seen that, Amir. Uh, Al Kingsley. Good afternoon, present. Uh, Nitin Patel. Here. Councillor Anna Smith. Yeah. Present. Uh, Re Rebecca Stevens. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Andy Williams, who I believe is joining late. Uh, and myself, Mike Hurd. Uh, could the Democratic Services Officer please report any apologies for absence that have been received? Thank you, Chair. We've had apologies today from Tina Barsby and from Andy Williams. Thank you very much. Uh, this is also an opportunity for uh, any of the members to declare pecuniary interests or any other conflicts of interest. Do any members have any conflicts of interest to declare? Uh, Mike, if possible, I could just declare Chamber of Commerce because there might be some discussions that overlap today. OK, thank you, Vic. That's uh, duly noted. Good. Uh, anything else? No. Uh, we are asked to approve the minutes of the meeting held on the 15th of May 2023. Can I ask whether any member disagrees with the accuracy of these minutes? Uh, I can see no uh, such indication. Uh, so uh, I see no further objections, so we will take that as carried. Uh, do officers have any further updates to report on the action log? No, no further updates, Jim. Okay. Thank One you. thing I did notice was uh, on the timeline for potential exits. We obviously have the target date shown is March 2023, so we might need to have a, a new target date for that. Noted. Thank you. Board. Uh, good. Right. We now move on to uh, item 2.1, which is the business board chair's update. I think the only thing I really wanted to bring up was uh, an update on the appointment of the appointment process for the new chair. So I understand we've had uh, 11 applications and five were interviewed. And today those interviews were having a fireside chat, which I'm sure was uh, warming. And uh, final interviews are due to be held on the 27th of July, uh, with confirmation hopefully at the September Business Board. Uh, is there any other information you want to give on that, Don? Or yes, please. Yes, please, Mike. So, um, as you rightly said, so we're aiming to have the final interviews done by the 27th of July. That would mean that we're hopefully um, be able to appoint by the end of the month. Sorry, there's a bit of an echo. Um, and business board members will be notified through um, urgency procedures to enable us to induct the new chair to take on the chairmanship um, at the September board. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we'll also be starting the recruitment of uh, new members for the business board as well to, to fill the vacancies uh, on that side, uh, looking to fill for September and November. Okay, uh, so I think the other meetings that were going to be Mike, reported on. Michael, sorry to interrupt. Sorry. Can I just make a note? Obviously, the, the process of, of uh, you know, appointing a, a 
a business boy chair, very important. And, you know, this, it was something that was highlighted at the last board minutes, you know, and one of the reasons that we've had to go through this and obviously some delay to the process. But I just wanted to put it on record that having highlighted the concerns from the business board, the uh, being delighted by the calibre of people that have come forward. It's proved, it, I'm, I'm obviously I'm still in the process of doing fireside chats with officers, but it's, I, I wanted to reassure the board that I think going forward, whatever happens, I believe we will have a good candidate coming forward. But I'm grateful for the officers taking note of that and making sure that Penner did their recruitment process at the level that we expected, and I've been reassured by it. Thank you, Nick. Uh, and Vic, you wanted to come Yeah, in? just to add to that, I was involved in the shortlist along with a couple of others, and I confirm uh, that we were very pleased with the quality of the candidates that have been put forward by Penner. So it's a marked difference to where we were a few months earlier. Excellent. And thank you also to the uh, members of the business board that had the uh, discussions with Penner as well and provided input to that. So thank you uh, all. And great that it's moving forward in terms of having uh, getting a new chair in place. Uh, Richard, uh, as executive director for Economy and Growth, the Combined Authority, do you wish to now give an update? Yeah, no, th 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 thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, just 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 to say, um, you know, obviously the, the, these updates that we've 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 added into the structure of the agenda are, are important for us moving forward, given the new model that we've moved towards with the business board now being an advisory board that works right across the full business of the combined authority. So I think it is important that we get this opportunity to create this um, two way communication opportunities, and I hope in future that we will provide you know, the opportunity for business board members that are now members of uh, the combined authority, other committees, the opportunity also to feed back uh, and pick up issues as they um, develop their roles as part of those committees moving forward. So I just wanted to um, flag that issue in particular. Um, yeah, just to say in the period uh, since the last uh, board meeting, just to report back, um, just 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 to just to raise the issue around we were talking last time i think about deeper devolution and people will remember that the uh, chancellor in the spring statement announced the trailblazer devolution deals and subsequently we've been working quite hard to work alongside the m10 to to extend the rollout of those trail trailblazer deals uh, across the other combined authorities including cambridgeshire and peterborough and it was interesting that the lga conference last week, Michael Gove um, confirmed that that was indeed his intention. And as a result of that work, um, since the last board meeting, officers have been working uh, alongside officials with DLUC, uh, with the Department for Transport as well, and uh, the Department for Business and Trade in relation to working through some of those things that, that, that may be important. And I think moving forwards, it will be really good to get the engagement of the business board and business board members uh, as we take forward those opportunities uh, in, in negotiation with government as, the, as that process works through. It's very much a technical process at the moment, but hopefully it will in one way or another lead to the opportunity for some further deeper devolution for the area, which can only be um, a good thing. So that was one thing I wanted to mention. I also wanted to mention that last, uh, just, just the Friday gone, uh, the mayor, who's obviously on this call, um, convened the rail summit, which was an excellent bringing together of the uh, other public, private and voluntary and community sectors to talk about the importance of rail and in particular, make some uh, raise the profile really of some key rail infrastructure across the across the patch and in particular make the business case for Ely Junction which I think went down extremely well and uh, it's exactly the sort of thing that government wants us to see us doing as a combined authority and again it's something that we uh, will want to engage the business board in in terms of uh, making sure that the future of the rail network and the transport priorities reflect uh, the aspirations of the business community moving forwards. There was also the Cambridge South announcement and the ministerial visit for the 200 million uh, four platform uh, South Railway, 
um, that's taken place, which I think is another great thing that's happened since the last meeting. Um, and we've also uh, now, I think, probably possibly got on this call our new chief executive, Rob Bridge, who has now started with the combined authority, uh, which, which now completes the um, corporate management team uh, for the uh, combined authority and is another demonstrator of our improvement moving forwards towards getting uh, a real significant organisation in play. Um, so I just wanted to mention some of those things. Um, there's one or two other things worth mentioning. The, the Growth Hub evaluation report has just come out from government. So that's something that we'll need to pick up. And also the Growth Works evaluation and review report has now been circulated to business board members. And then one final last thing to mention that uh, has been circulated to you all as business board members is the Department for Business and Trade uh, call for large capital projects as part of the UK Global Investment Summit in the autumn. So again, you know, if you can let us know if there are specific um, projects and uh, opportunities that you're pushing forward for in relation to that, then it'd be really good to keep us informed as the Secretariat for the uh, Business Board. And I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, any uh, comments from the floor? Good. Uh, thank you. So we now move on to uh, part three. And uh, if I could ask uh, Bruna to present the latest budget and performance report as our finance manager. Hello, nice, nice to see you all. Here we are with our performance and finance management. One second only, I'm here. So just to say this is a bit of a different report of compared with what you're used to. This is the first report to this financial year. So we're focusing on what is the possibility and what we, our budget and how we are expected to spend it in this financial year, not how much we have spent to date yet. So one second, I pick up the report again, that it would have been easier if I did it before, sorry. So, I thought I did it. The page disappeared. That's not helpful. <laughs> Very quickly. Sorry about that. That's okay. So, um, so this is, as I say, is to note the budget for next financial year. So what the total grant income that we are expecting to receive in next financial year, in this financial year, is uh, uh, three. 3,723 plus a further 375 of the third income from the previous year. So funds that we were expecting for the LEPCO funding that we were being um, withheld from base now DBT, um, that we are expecting to get in this financial year instead. So we are going to have roughly 4 million pounds worth of grant income that we are expecting to receive this year. Oh, this is a this is 600,000 or so more than what we had available, what we receive from the, from the different funds for the year just finished, the 22, 23 years. Um, the um, important, so important things to note is the community renewal fund, the CRF, and the ERDF are both being completed by the end of last financial year, and the share prosperity funds will actually start in, in earnest only this financial year. That's one of the reasons why you have yeah, more money coming from that side. Um, as what has, as I mentioned that before, so there is some further income expected from ADF in ESF just because some of the post delivery was postponed from 22 to 10, 23. In relation to cost related to our revenue, our revenue cost for the year, we are expecting it to be 7 million pounds compared with our previous year of 3.7 million. The 7 million pounds are mostly due to uh, catching up on golf coin cost, so 4.7 of the 7 million are actually growth cost. 
And this is, yes, working on uh, catching up on golf course activities uh, that they slowly come, come that they start slowly, but they are coming up freaking fast. And a part of it is actually ERDF and, and mostly is actually ERDF, but we are expecting to get closer to, you know, to catch up solidly through these. So we are confident that we are going to meet the back, the the budget that we were expecting. Also, I say that uh, um, we are aware that the, the performance of the EFDF pro program is being very good to date, and actually has been achieved all the job target that is achieved all the job target we were expecting to get from this project this program. So this side was really positive. So, um, so as I say. Uh, at present, we don't have an update on the energy side. In relation to capital, you can see then again, we have 14 million pounds to spend to, in this financial year, seven from this budget and seven uh, slippage from previous one. Majority of it, half of, more than half of the 14 million is related to growth co capitals. Uh, and uh, um, apologies for the noise in that came in. Um, yes, and on this one as well, we are catching up. We are still reasonably confident that this is going to happen, but uh, you know, there is Something a else. lot of work before the end. Sorry, Karen. Just a quick question I was going to ask, Bruno. Uh, with the uh, equity investments being made by sort of growth co. Um, Obviously, that's all going to be done within, uh, I guess, before Christmas uh, on that side. Is it? Do we have to make them? Uh, have we? Are we committed that that those funds have to be made in that way, or is there a chance to to review how they are, how those funds are used? I I think we can definitely. We, we um, from my perspective, the important thing is that we use it uh, in the right way. We don't necessarily need to that giving them away. If we don't think the uh, the the capital that uh, we would wa want to work on is actually appropriate, okay. Steve, uh, if it's something worth to do, yes. But yeah. at the same time, it, you know, let's not throw money to something we don't want to. Uh, Steve, but, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, sorry. And Brune has kind of covered it there. The whilst the um, contract with Growth Works has a set figure, there's a jobs target attached to delivery um with the service starting late absolutely if 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 they by the end of the contract there isn't enough investable um uh, opportunities put forward to the investment panel there's absolutely no reason to um invest it all and that's within our right that's reserved to the ca and growth code right thank you al just a quick one for Bruna. Obviously, for understandable region, reasons, there's been quite a lot of slippage between year on original budget. Um, yeah, we, we're putting obviously all that focus on budget for next year. Have we made any assumptions of likely slippage into 24, 25 or deferral of any of our expected investments? If, uh, uh, in theory, yes, in for everything else, yes. In relation to uh, golf, co golf works activity, no, because the program is expecting to finish by the end of December. So in, in theory, yes, of course, we will have done it. But, and, and this is taking in account other activities that you, I mean, in the specific, I cannot see anything to jump up on the capital side, uh, but, Yes, but not not for golf walks. Okay, so so in I'm terms saying. of in terms of the budget for twenty um, three four, we've made the assumption it would be in year spend at this stage. Yes, but especially for golf walks, because the contract will finish in December. For other things, like for example, below there is that market down that I know is not your hair here, but anyway, we always give you an an understanding of it. Some of them has been slipped out of 23, 24, thinking that it's going to be completed in 24, 25. This is not what we can do for uh, Golf Corps because we are not Golf Works, 
because we're not going to work on that contract anymore. So it might go somewhere else, but not quite the same thing. Sorry, I hope I explained myself properly. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's clear. Uh, uh, any other comments? Yeah, just just on that comment, Steve, about not fulfilling all of it in equity. Does that mean we can use it for something else and will we still have to finish by December? Um, so, yes, um, that's a decision we could look at. Um, I guess because the contract, obviously, the, the, the mechanism, if you like, to do the due diligence and everything else, which is what the um, GEG contract provides, once that, once that um, goes, we... We obviously wouldn't. We'd, we'd want to put it towards something new with a new mechanism. But I understand what you're saying. You're sort of saying, could we redirect it, say, into grants or something? And that and that is a conversation we could have. But it, it kind well, of either either that or, or we need to do something because if we if we can't find the companies and we don't want to use it, well, then that, 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 it's going to be sat there if we do nothing else. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, it's not going anywhere because it's it's staying with us unless it's claimed. So we do something else with it. Um, and, and I know the next paper does sort of cover a bit of that. OK, well, we can maybe talk about it after uh, and see if, what else we can do. I think the other point from that was that the in the Growth Works review, there was some question as to whether uh, some of the investments or how were they were strategically aligned with the, uh, the the economic strategy? So that might have been a need for, for review as well. Good. Um, so uh, this uh, paper was just for uh, members to the recommendation is just to note. So uh, hopefully we can all agree that we have noted. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you very much, Bruno. Just, Mike, it did say we're supposed to vote on it, but I think that's a mistake, right? Because we don't vote on noting something. No, no, it's a mistake, yes. Sorry, sorry, Vic, yes, it's a mistake. No, you don't need to vote. Okay. Sorry, apologies. Uh, thanks, Vic. I'm actually following from a different set of papers, so I might not see, see that. So, Okay, uh, item 3.2. Uh, is the business board plan for remaining strategic funds. Uh, Steve Clark, as Interim Associate Director of Business, uh, if you could present, please. Yeah, good afternoon, board. Um, so this paper presents um, a proposed spend plan for the remaining recycled growth funds and enterprise zone income budget. Um, current, currently at the moment, the recycled growth funds is what's being used to provide that equity and grants, um, but there is there is more still in that budget. Um, the paper contains a proposed shortlist of options which were discussed and agreed by the Business Board Working Group on the 25th of May. Um, the Business Board currently has uh, 6.26 million available over this and the next three financial years, and that funding is split between 3.3 million capital and 2.87 revenue. Um, the working group were most positive about three particular areas which were which are being proposed in this paper, and they are to create a new economy team, as we're coining it, um, which is to utilise some revenue funding to create a team to champion, facilitate and attract um, uh, and win funding for opportunities to deliver the priority sector strategies and, in turn, some elements of the economic growth strategy. Um, the second one was a team Cambridgeshire business support function. Um, so this is proposed use of revenue funding to um, resource internal staff um, to continue business support post growth works um, for the next three financial years. Um, this being the base level of growth hub service, which we get a grant from government for um, transferring back into CPCA. Um, and then additional resource and activity added to that growth hub in terms of its service offer to the market. And then the final area was um, the capital funding. So um, to continue with the thought of um, uh, a, a final plan, uh, assigning capital grants of the money we've got available for making them more flexible, um, to be used by businesses or organizations. The criteria 
yet to be determined by the board at this stage. This is just a nod to say this is the way we'll go and we'll draw up the plan. Um, but the criteria thus far suggested has been um, clearly projects that are somehow linked to priority sectors, um, export enablement by uh, for companies who are currently being held back or put off from taking forward um, export work, um, incentive grants to incentivize new companies to invest in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, um, or small amounts to unlock infrastructure projects. Um, these might be, for example, an investment site where you know um, growth uh, could be sustainable growth could be achieved, but is unlikely to happen without support. Um, all of the um, uh, work around capital grants or all the thoughts and ideas around capital grants would be subject to CPCA single assurance framework, which is currently being reviewed as well. We'd have to adhere to that process. Um, so the actual outline spending plan being proposed here um, suggests um, spending 1.15 million of revenue on that new economy team, 1.719 million of revenue on that team Cambridgeshire business support provision, and the remaining flexible capital grant pot, currently 3.3, could be bigger if some of that capital doesn't get spent um, through GoFWorks or beyond that contract and any slippage through this year. So um, that would all go into the same pot. Um, so the business board is asked to agree and recommend this proposal to the combined authority board for that this spending plan of those two streams over the next four years. I'll pause there, if that's okay, Chair, and happily take any questions. Sure. Uh, I, I noticed in the uh, in your report that it also said that the, uh, the Growth Hub, we have funding through till next March, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. The current year, it has been confirmed by DBT. Uh, and if they, the government confirms future years, then that's additional funds that can come back into uh, our spending study. Yeah, ab absolutely um, correct. And we can utilise that to um, bolster the service. Um, the, uh, and the area of expanding the Growth Hub activity is, sorry, I forgot to say, is something that the local authorities have been talking to them about, Team Cambridgeshire approach. It's about building the ecosystem of business support in a with a much smaller budget than what we've had thus far compared to the growth works um service uh vic do you want to come in there thank you two things first firstly um i look i i like the idea that we're being asked to sort of think about these three main areas um i'd like just to understand a little bit more around the team cambridgeshire business support because um, I haven't necessarily seen a lot of collaboration between some of our local authorities of late, and I'd like to see some sort of um, change in the way that they come together to to, to work. And I, I use, for example, the Rural Development Fund, um, and and you know, and I recognise that that might be slightly controversial what I'm saying, but I'm basically in support of it. But I want some sort of evidence to say this will be a success. Bringing them together is probably the most important thing we can do, um, because the you know everyone knows businesses don't stop at council boundaries. Um, and then the second part of it, I'll now raise my hand again from a chamber of commerce perspective. I, the, the you know what export enablement we have seen such a fall off of the number of companies exporting. It's been um, very very significant, and something needs to be done to get them back. Um, and that's possibly an overlap with my day-to-day -day job. So I raise, remind you of my conflict of interest in that space. Um, but I'm obviously very interested from a chamber perspective in anything that helps get companies exporting because it's fallen off a cliff. Sorry, and Vic, has he gone? He's still there. Just uh, Vic, Vic, what are the key things that stops them? Because I suppose... You know, if we're going to do something specific, it'd be nice to understand what it is that has really, I mean, paperwork they keep on all saying, but I mean, we should have been able to get over that by now, I hope. But what else stops them? There's all sorts of barriers to, to, to trading, not just, um, 
you know, financial barriers, but some countries use their, their documentation system as an effective tool right to prevent people being able to come into their marketplaces so you know the the idea so the reason sorry the reason i raised that was because i went to one of the events that the export guys wanted and he can't can't get them to understand that level though that when they talk about what does export need it's all about approvals and the nitty gritty of trying to sell those products and i don't think they have the depth to be able to support that so if we're going to do something i think it needs to be specific i think it needs to be multi-layered you 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 know what we need first of all is to make people understand that it is possible still to export and we need to try and help them find markets they can take their products yeah. to so first of all it needs to be much higher level um you know what is your strategy for asia latin america you know and, and trying to educate businesses that there is a possibility to still do business um even though it seems to have become more difficult but the second part of this is then when they do start to do this is hooking them up with people in those overseas markets that can help them and then the third part and this is all you know 101 of exporting is making sure they can complete the paperwork properly because the, the any small mistake in paperwork can cause enormous amounts of problems with things being held up at customs um, but it's also coming back as well receiving products back in from overseas customs declarations it, you know with the eu especially it's just got much much worse than it's ever been um despite of course brexit enabling rather than restricting trade uh thanks for that clarification uh rebecca uh, yeah, firstly, just to totally agree with Vic on collaboration, and, and I've got a number of comments which I'll, I'll save for the next item on the agenda, because I think we're going to talk about that again in a minute. Mm -hmm. So my real question was in um, five point something, it says um, approval of the plan would allocate all the available budget for the next four financial years and so limit the business board's ability to react to events within that time horizon. Mm -hmm. And what kind of events would those be that we're limiting ourselves on? So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a bit hard to obviously say what could all the events be. I mean, if you look back over the last two or three years, you can see that there's been quite a tumultuous <laughs> series of various events. So who knows? Um, you know, there, there, there could be, um, I mean, it could go both ways. It's not just negative stuff. There could be something very positive suddenly appears that we we would want to react or, or put money towards. Um, uh, I think, though, a case could be made to the combined authority. Um, I mean, holding some of this money back in the hope or, or in the in case, um, I mean, the combined authority itself does have some resources and it would be a combined authority res response to anything that's happening. And bear in mind, the business board is moving away from being a programme board more to a advisory board. So actually um it's hard to know that could change if government policy changes around um future let type structures and and you know who knows um but yeah i mean this is obviously a key implication that you know uh on the finance side which is which has been in and the board need to be comfortable um about whether to um not commit all of it or, or what the other thing to add sorry is enterprise zone receipts of which we're talking about a three-year window here does go on for 19 years so you would have another 16 years of enterprise zone income from which you could ask to draw forward if you needed funds to to do something in a in a you know in a fast or emergency case and there can always be a danger if everyone holds a contingency uh, Al. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm broadly in support. Uh, one question was around um, the new economy team. I, I suppose from a, a level of investment that's been proposed there to cover over the next three years, um, the natural challenge would be: is how would we identify that as being delivery of additional capacity and not, in effect, offsetting existing capacity under the umbrella of that that new team? Yeah, I think, um, well, it's, it's covered in the next paper. I think these two papers could have been run into one. But um, I think that's clear that when we draw up the um, work plan around that resource, that we would need to put in some key targets, key milestones of achievement. So whether that's key big things to in support of the devolution to 
agenda. So in, create an innovation plan, draw that up. We can see that that's tangible, that's done, that's a milestone. Or a trade and investment plan, because we do not have an international plan at the moment, whereas many other combined authorities do. Um, but then actually we could assign particular outputs um, against those particular roles. So whether that's um, delivery of a set number of the recommendations in some of those sector strategies, or whether that's delivery of a ta target of outputs. Um, we could look at jobs. We could look at um, things like that. They're a little bit more emotive if some of the things we want to do don't come off in time, you know. Um, but yeah, but no, I think I think in our plan, we would be quite clear about what the outputs are that we are hoping to achieve through this. And see, just on that, I'm playing slightly playing devil's advocate. I know in the, in the subsequent paper, there's there's a within that category, there's both the, the physical um, human resource and also some of the funding towards policy development. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's a natural question, which is, you know, that's one where we've, we've in the past we have spent at times considerably on external advice and guidance, which has a potential to be quite significant. Yeah. So obviously there's a natural, which is creating a team. It would be good to have an understanding as to how much of that was about policy and idea development versus how much was actually implementation and, and delivery. I think I would like to say it's mainly about uh, implementation and delivery because that's what we've struggled with doing with those sector strategies. I, I think there's a slight amount of policy potentially, as I mentioned, two things that we don't have. I mean, Richard may have more commentary on that because there's, there's obviously things which are going to be incredibly useful when we uh, uh, take forward our relationship with DBT and others as part of devolution. So, yeah. Uh, Richard, do you want to come back? Yeah, no, th uh, thank, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. I think, I think what we're trying to do here a little bit is, I mean, if, if you look at the um, the models of other combined authorities, they they do have um, they are developing their capacity in house much more, and I think it helps because it, it enables you know that that corporate memory and that carry through as more and more you know foundations are laid from ministerial announcements and everything else. It's good to have that core capacity in house to enable it to be able to be quite agile to the changing shifts in, in government policy and everything else, and actually keep quite a strong focus on delivery. Um, and I think this is kind of where we've, you know, certainly coming from the outside looking in, it felt to me that we had developed some very significant sector strategies on, on, in our area across agri-tech, life sciences and everything else. But actually, we hadn't really got the capacity to follow through. And as was mentioned, we, we have relied probably too much on external um, consultancies uh, and, 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 and do, doing short pieces of work to, to, to bridge these gaps when, in effect, building up that capacity um, in-house can, can really reap rewards. And it's interesting, we're not the only combined authority um, seeking to go through this sort of process at the moment. I mean, I know the Northeast, for example, are very much trying to do this. And this was all this this model is probably based on what Greater Manchester did a long time ago, which was to, to build that in-house capacity, that in-house expertise, that ability to understand the dynamics of the economy, regardless of what the economic circumstances were, to enable us to build our strategies and plans and delivery accordingly and I think what we're trying to do it just feels at the moment that we're trying to do everything on a bit of a shoestring and and perhaps you know things just feel a little bit too dense to us when we when we get the feedback from things that have been done contractually it just feels a long way from where we are in terms of the interventions we're actually making and I'm not really clear that some of that narrative is feeding back into conversations with government and it isn't giving giving the government the confidence that we actually, you know, are on these things and are doing these things, even though we are. And I think this in-house capacity will enable us to communicate that much better. Hopefully it would also be a way of uh, building more strategic partnerships and having a more integrated uh, services with uh, other partners uh, around us, which is from the outside, it seemed to be very disjointed uh, on that side, lots of duplication. Uh, Rebecca. 
Uh, yeah, I was going to I was going to wait. But seeing as we're talking about it now, I, I, I absolutely agree with the theory behind this. I think what we need to be really, really careful of is what happens six months in or a year in or 18 months in and how we monitor it, because I think there's a real danger here in us just having another layer of sort of local authority bureaucracy or all, all, all the councils have got their own economic development teams. And what we mustn't do is just be another layer of doing the same sort of thing um, without actually adding any extra value. And I think it's really important that we monitor this on an ongoing basis, like we would with any project, but we get that. What, you know, what Richard has just very eloquently said it is why we need it and, and what we need it to do. And we need to make sure it does that. And it just doesn't become um, another member of staff filling in the holes of, you know, real life where everything gets in the way of everything else. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Smith. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think what we can do though very successfully is to be a convener for the economic development officers and to provide them with the opportunity to network across our region. So Vic referenced that earlier in terms of the importance of working across council boundaries. And I think that's a really powerful role that we have. Uh, Mayor? <laughs> it's funny, Anna, you, you, you know my job too well. You almost stole my thunder. Uh, but I actually wanted to just to reiterate that point speaking on a personal level, um, you know, both myself and increasingly Anna, we get go in each in different directions and often get given business cards. You know, we're in a, we're at a, a venue whatever, and, the, and we have this whole thing about people approaching us wanting to work with the organization that we, and, and certainly we meet, uh, I, I meet as the mayor and, and actually Anna, you will have um, had a pass from the separate authorities, an economic development officer. And I think, Speaking personally, I always struggled as I met economic development officers, be it in Finland, be it in uh, Cambridge City, be it Peterborough, to suddenly make the links with my own organisation. And instead, I found myself funneling lots of kind of this is where the people I need to be talking to, but actually not having within the own organisation the right person to say go to. In the past, it's sort of been, oh, well, you know, that's growth works. You know, that, it, it's. I think it's absolutely essential. I, I, it's not for me to be part of the design of this team, but it's something that hasn't been able to enact. And, and although I actually appreciate, Rebecca, your point of view, not creating another layer of bureaucracy, it goes back to the role of what is the combined authority above? You know, what is it for? And it keeps going back to this convening role where we can get the best out of all those officers at those different constituent authority levels. And then in the hope, in the way that hopefully the politicians are beginning to work together, then officers, the, the same is seen now in terms of a strategy, an improved strategy in our transport team. Now that transport officers are talking to a, a lead head transport person within the combined authority, we're beginning to see real momentum. Um, and we don't have that kind of specific role business development currently within the combined authority. And I, I think it's a, a very positive step forward. Good, uh, thank you for that and uh, and all the input. There seems to be a generally positive uh, feel uh, in the room. Uh, so um, in order to support those recommendations, I'm quite happy to read out the full recommendation if you like. Sorry, or I'm Mike. Just say, Mike. Mike, Mike, sorry, I have yeah. a hand up. Belinda. Oh, sorry, Belinda, um, You're lost in a field. Sorry, um, I concur with everything that's been said. I'm just wondering, we've all said numerous times how valuable the meeting was that we had in Huntington. I think it must have been a, a, a well over a year ago now. And for this to be implemented and to land well and set off on the right foot, I wonder if it might be appropriate to have that conversation with colleagues from the other authorities as well, just to ensure that this uh, is, is seen in the spirit that it's meant and not misinterpreted. Okay, thank you very much uh, right. for that. 
Can I just respond to that, Mike? Um, of course, Steve. Yeah, 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 sorry. Um, so just on the point about local authority collaboration, that we, we have been meeting, uh, I've been convening economic development officers, um, I think we've met three times on the whole um, design of what follows growth works, that team Cambridge a bit. So that's in train. But we're also under the governance um, uh, changes, we're setting up an economic growth officers advisory group. And that um, we're going to table that this will be one of the key agenda items in terms of that whole new economy working together under sectors and of course the whole joined up team Cambridgeshire on on business support so just thought I'd mention that and I, and I do agree with Belinda I think I think you're referring to the business board and CA board gathering I think and I, and I think that that um, that must have been in October or November so you're right um, we, we should look to be scheduling that some point soon I guess come back together uh, Vic? Yeah, um, so for my tuppence, we have each of the economic development officers uh, from each of the councils or on our um, regional committees. And so Team Cambridge is definitely the buzz phrase at the moment. There is nothing negative being said about it at all. And I think they'll welcome this. It won't be seen as anything, um, you know, being put on them. I think it's it's just helping them to do a, and achieve more. Um, but I do think maybe at the highest level, it needs to be properly shared. Uh, so I think that last comment you made, Steve, was spot on, that it does need to go before the higher board. Um, and But the one thing I will say is, uh, and I like the phrase, enabling, convening, supporting. I, I don't necessarily think I want to see, um, uh, maybe I'm, I'm in the minority, but I don't necessarily want to see um, council officials out there doing things uh, that are often done um, by the private sector. I, I want them be using their offices to bring people together that can then make these things happen rather than you know, the delivery role. Thank you. So if, uh, if there's no more comments, uh, perhaps if, uh, if there's anyone that disagrees with their recommendation, perhaps they could uh, make themselves known. Uh, otherwise, we'll um, carry it forward unanimously. Thank you. So uh, item 3.3 uh, is the Business Board Priority Sector Strategies. Steve, again, if you could um, present. Yeah, thank you. And of course, we've just discussed quite a lot of this, I think. Um, so yeah, following from 3.2, um, the board is well aware we have four sector strategies. Um, we currently have an action plan um, for the agri-tech. The other strategies don't necessarily have um, any form of implementation plan. So, um, so to develop and implement um, or even create an, an action plan, um, there is a requirement for that additional support. Um, obviously, we've already highlighted that the current team do not have the capacity to be able to do a lot of that work to be able to drive through all the various recommendations so the, this paper um obviously provides um sorry is proposing to identify the funding to support the recruitment of um resources to facilitate coordinate attract funding and deliver those recommendations um it sort of broadly sets out that we have four economic growth champions one assigned to every sector um potentially a trade and investment um, expert or officer, and then an innovation or potentially doubling up as a business uh, decarbonisation net zero um, officer as well. And then as we've talked about, there's scope to obviously use some of the fundings to provide some admin support and other tools that we might need to, to get this delivered. The budgets that it's proposed to be taken from is the recycled growth fund. So half a million, so 500,000 over the this and that for, for three years um, and enterprise zone income, 650,000. Um, the, the current proposal here would be to deliver um, following. So developing a job specification for those roles, recruit and embed the resources, produce those implementation plans for the sectors, um, develop an overall work plan that includes all those outputs and outcomes as part of a new economy team. Um, 
work out and target the modes and me methods detail how we would achieve delivery of those plans. So whether that's through devolution, whether that's through bidding, or whether that's through convening the private sector, um, and then work with particular business board members as champions of those sectors, and also work with sector bodies and private sector um, in delivery of that. Um, develop propositions, uh, particularly around inward investment, and obviously provide regular updates to the business board and combined authority, provide advice and, and guidance where it's required. Um, so as we've sort of set out, having the expert resources um, will give us the opportunity to focus on those recommendations in, in each of those strategies. Um, and ultimately, aid to the delivery of the combined authority economic growth strategy. Um, and as I've already mentioned, one of the key things I think would be a good signal is the alignment of these resources is good preparation for delivery of a second devolution deal. And I'll stop there as we've already talked about it quite a bit and take happily take any further questions. Uh, something I was going to mention, Steve, was uh, obviously with the uh, business board members uh, adding to those uh, those sector committees, that sort of thing is quite key to get the business board recruitment right to to regain that sort of balance uh, on the board to have that sort of sector knowledge uh, so presumably that, that that comes in over the next uh, few months but yeah. uh, uh, it's it's important to use the, our current board membership to encourage others to to apply for that and to identify potential candidates uh, on that side yeah absolutely agree uh, and any further sort of uh, comments uh, from this? Obviously, there's a lot of detail to uh, develop, uh, but the the key recommendations are to really get that sort of uh, uh, understanding on the budget and have that to go up to the main uh, CPCA board. Um, okay. Again, are there any uh, objections to the the recommendations? Uh, if not, uh, we will take them forward and carry this unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, and on to item 3.4, which is the uh, SPF Rural England Prosperity Fund implementation. And Louisa, if you could uh, present. I should say Louisa Simpson is the Strategic Funds Programme Lead. Good afternoon, board. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm presenting the um, paper on the Rural England Prosperity Fund. Uh, there are there is an additional recommendation that will be tabled uh, relating to this paper. Um, the um, the board will be aware that the Shared Prosperity Fund was approved. Um, and we are mobilizing uh, our implementation plan. Um, in December last year, we submitted an addendum to our Shared Prosperity Fund, which was for the Rural England Prosperity Fund, which is a DEFRA um, pot of money that has been allocated to rural districts uh, within the combined authority. So four districts have access to these funds those being East Cams, Fenland, South Cams and Huntingdonshire. Um, the allocation was uh, 3.2 million uh, shared between those three districts um, on a uh, allocation that was worked out by DEFRA on businesses and population. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily um, that the rural areas, for example, Fenland received the the highest amount of funding and they actually received the lowest amount of funding because of the way the allocation worked. Um, we haven't had to, the addendum was approved by the leaders in each district as per uh, Deluxe guidance. Um, and so the addendum has not been to the combined authority board for um, approval. It was, it was approved by those four districts who received funding. Uh, so as part of this paper, we're looking for a recommendation from the business board to um, authorise, to um, approve the uh, approval of the 
uh, addendum, plus the proposal around delegated authority to allow us to effectively manage the uh, programme of works across the four districts. Um, and also as uh, lead authority to take an overarching um, view of the submissions. The grants, uh, the, the programme itself is predominantly grants um, to be issued on um, an application basis. So each of the districts will advertise the scheme, um, take applications run the usual due diligence that we we would expect um, any grant applicant to go through. Um, and we are asking for um, authority to um, ratify those decisions that are made by each of the districts and that payments will be made via the combined authority. It should be noted that there is no administration um, support uh, with this fund, so the districts would be um, uh, supporting the grant applications and the application process and the payments um, from their SPF pot of administration, which is very small. Uh, so we propose to um, manage the financial allocation uh, of the grants uh, through the combined authority, uh, making it a simpler process for the districts. Um, the, there are three projects um, that we are asking the Business Board to note, uh, which have been proposed by East Cams and uh, two by South Cams. East Cams are looking to support uh, their Little Port project, um, which was part of their levelling up fund bid, which wasn't successful. Uh, they have resubmitted to us a proposal that only 550,000 is spent on Littleport and the remaining is allocated to grants for rural businesses. And South Cams have um, requested to allocate a small proportion of their, um, of their rural um, fund to, to community projects, uh, community gardens, and uh, rural business support. Uh, the uh, paper outlines how uh, we will manage the fund and how we'll move forward in terms of delivery. Are there any questions? Thank you, Louisa. Um, do the districts need any help in sort of coordinating their uh, review of grants or, or that type of thing or is that something that they can do together or the districts have um we we've worked with the districts quite closely on this we've worked we've worked quite hard with the economic development officers uh, our initial proposal was for um one panel to look at all proposals that came in on the rural fund um but this wasn't, wasn't taken forward by the districts. What we proposed is that we would sit on each of their panels, that there would be a representative from the combined authority who would assist on each of those panels and support those panels. Uh, in terms of the um, due diligence and the checks that they'll need to do on those applications, the districts have said they're happy to carry those out themselves. Okay, thank you. Uh, Matt, are you on mute, I think? Just starting now. Uh, Louisa, thank you yes. for that. This, in some ways, is, is a very positive uh, development. Uh, and I know I've had the benefit of your uh, presentation. Oh, well, you know, we spoke before this at the end of last week. I have a problem, though, uh, in, in terms of it's almost there's a pre- with particularly with regard to the East Cambridgeshire project, um, this predetermined that it's going to be spent there. And, and I know without knowing the full details, and we've just you've just given me a whole narrative of what we're going to do at the combined authority, you know, which is entirely appropriate. But 
but East Cambridge have already said we, we know what we're going to do. And, and I'm in, keen to understand if if people haven't had a chance to bid into this, residents, rural um, small businesses, CICs, uh, charities to bid into this, the, all the, the all the opportunities already gone in East Cambridgeshire. Could you can you clarify that point? Because this is it's suddenly the 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 whole processing. Uh, and it gives me, of course, for concern. And this this mirrors other situations where there was sort of a predetermined, uh, we, this is the way we're going to spend it, not necessarily in conjunction with what I would say is the uh, the passporting body, the combined authority. We should be we should be part of this. I mean, you talked about setting up a a panel, be it with representatives of the business board, but where's the business board been involved in this, along with our strategies? I'm happy to come back to you. Um, we have. I, I've, I've spoken at great length with East Cams um, and the economic development team there. Uh, I also have had uh, numerous discussions with DLUC and DEFRA with regards to whether this was uh, something that was allowed within the scheme. Um, DEFRA and DLUC were very clear uh, in all the webinars that we've attended that this is predominantly a grant uh, fund is a grant scheme. What they have said is you can have projects though. And if, uh, if a project is put forwards um, and it is deemed to be um, something that uh, the district feel will meet the interventions and the outputs and outcomes, then DLUC and DEFRA don't have an issue with it. We, on the other hand, have said that um, we're not able to approve the change in terms of East Cam's moving from a grant scheme to a total, to pretty much a total project um, delivery and not offering the same grant opportunities. There's some feedback, sorry. Um, and uh, so what, the, what will actually have to happen um, Mayor, is that whilst we've asked the business board to note that a project has been brought forward, it is not in any way approving that project for funding. The district will need to complete a change request form. Uh, they'll need to um, present why they feel that this is the best use of these funds. And what we will need to do is um, we'll need to ascertain whether that is a major or minor change. A minor change is something that we are able to deal with within the combined authority. A major change will have to go to DLUC for approval. So whilst they have said this is how they would like to spend the money, in no way is that um, approved um and um for them to do yet there's a whole process to go through with regards to that so there are certain there's certainly quite a bit of work still to do to enable them if that's what they want to do to enable them to do that and it may be that after we've worked through the process actually it isn't approved okay but how can we how unless you can tell me straight away now but i I feel uncomfortable about this on the grounds that what what were the other what, what were the other options? What, where was this put out to the residents of East Cambridgeshire to kind of where, where's the evidence that you know we talk about consultation and being transparent, but I can't see we're going to do this now. You could argue that democratic mandate, you know, as the leadership of the East Cambridgeshire says, that allows us to do it. But I thought these processes were for people to bid into. You know, and I can't see even before we've actually given the go ahead that people have had an opportunity, you know, businesses in East Cambridgeshire, residents in East Cambridgeshire, where have they had an opportunity to bid into this uh, fund? Uh, and, Richard, and, do you want to come? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go on. No, no, no. Go, on. Richard, it's fine. Go on. You, yeah, all, all of it. I, I mean, I've got a lot of. I've got a lot of sympathy with where you know where Nick's coming from with, with this, and I think I think ultimately you know we want we want to get to a position where you know we transition towards 
that the, the position that Nick is outlining, I think, which is kind of that it would be much better, wouldn't it? And we all think this, you know, the, the funding comes through and then we, we have a process and we, we, we make a decision based on the best use of that process. And ultimately, you know, you would, you would be putting these projects through our own single assurance framework because, you know, we wouldn't want to be letting anything go that doesn't meet the criteria and the, 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 the standard and the challenge, if you like, around our own single insurance framework, which is why, you know, government expects combined authorities to host those robust single assurance frameworks in the first place. But this is a kind of a legacy of, of, of you know, um, almost, you know, ministerial diktat, if you like, where, you know, things have been almost passported through. People have been able to see their allocations and therefore they are then in a position to kind of sort of say, well, this is kind of what we want to do with it. If they are doing that, then you're, again, you're right that, that it's almost for the district to, uh, to, to be held to account because it's responsible for choosing how it wants to deal with its rural, you know, rural fund. And therefore it's a decision, uh, you know, like you say, maybe it's a decision for the residents of East Cambridgeshire as to whether the, the, the council has gone through due process in determining the right project in the first place, you know, but that's probably, you know, by the time it's got down to that level, subsidiarity tells us that it's, that it's down to the locality to determine how it wishes to, to, to spend that, to spend that uh, spend that money as it's passported through, but that still does leave us with an issue because if that money then gets passported through and is spent in that way, we are held to account back at the centre for the way in which that that project performs or doesn't perform. So we do we do have a legitimate uh, handle in terms of intervening and saying, well, actually, you may have said that it was going to achieve these outputs, but it isn't achieving those outputs, and therefore we'll withhold you know the funding in the future. I'm hoping that, you know, as deeper devolution moves forward, we might move to a, a more rational way of um, providing a settlement for the area that enables this kind of a problem to be avoided. But I, I do understand, you know, the difficulties as to where this has got, got us to. Uh, Vic. Thank you. Um, so wh wh where I come from is what's the business board role in this, because an awful lot of what's been said, whilst I support it, I'm not necessarily sure it's the, the business board's job. I mean, this fund, as I understand, the, is, is for local authorities to do business development, farm business diversification and community infrastructure. Um, and there's no um, yeah. guidance as to how much they should spend on each of those things. And I'm not sure despite what you've just said, Richard, about us uh, being able to sort of be held accountable, I'm not sure the business board is in that space at all. And I don't think we are um, gonna be held accountable should this money not be spent properly because I don't think it's a business board activity. I, I worried as soon as I saw community gardens coming in, when I think the priority should be business development activity, um, it, it worried me, but I do understand this has been put down to, to the local authorities. But that was where my earlier comment came from, wanting to see more of this Team Cambridgeshire. Um, and, and the four local authorities that have got this money, surely it could be better spent had it been given to the combined authority, 3.2 million, and then the combined authority could have decided who would get what. As it is, mm -hmm. South Cam's got three times as much as Finland. I think logic tells me that doesn't make sense, but I know it's to do with headcount. But I just want to question, how far in can the business board form an opinion on this? Because I genuinely, I, I feel we're going in a bit further than we are probably mm. uh, prescribed to do as part of our role. So I'd welcome advice on that. So as I understand it, we're, we're not being asked to uh, approve uh, any of the projects, uh, though I guess we can uh, minute a, a uh, concerns uh, uh, over it from that side and that uh, the recommendations that we've been asked to approve are all about uh, delegating authority within this, the CPCA main board. So uh, uh, I think that's right, Louisa? Yes. Yeah, that's correct. So to, to, to a certain extent, it seems like we're just passing something through uh, and uh, because it has to be passed through us, but, I, but we don't have to pass that through without noting an objection, I, I guess is true. Can I clarify then, we're not being asked to approve the Little Port funding or the no. uh, 
no, 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 no not at all. Know. It's it's literally to note that those projects have been proposed, um, and uh, what I think it's it's enabled me to gain is a bit of a feel for where people are, for where uh, the business board are and the business board members are, in terms of those particular projects, and in particular it, the um, Little Port project, but actually none of those projects will be approved until they've gone through a change request process. So there'll be an additional process that they'll need to go through and they may not get approved. We don't know. They'll, you know, that's where our role as lead authority sits to ensure that um, those decisions are made with the right information um, uh, and sort of fit with the uh, ethos of the fund itself. Mm. Sorry, Steve. Oh, oh. Well, I was, I, I was just going to add, I, I think actually there's a separate thing for us to do here, to engage with East Cambridge here on this particular project. I'm aware of it, because I'm aware of their levelling up fund bid that was unsuccessful last time round. Um, I, I think there's a separate parallel engagement needs to happen from our officer's side and maybe from the member's side about what this little ball project, what can be done to support it other than using this rural money because clearly it's something that East Cambridgeshire want to do. And so there's, you know, what else What else can we look at? I talked earlier in the other paper about a flexible grant scheme that unlocks particular sites or something like that. Maybe there's a separate conversation to be had um, about this. And of course, who knows whether there's a levelling up round three on the horizon as well. Uh, Nick? It's, yeah, yes, <laughs> it feels like I'm always following people who speak, speak a lot of sense before me. It's Steve, thank you for that. It's just to kind of reiterate the point that the reason I raised this was the idea of spending all my time trying to get the sort of cohesiveness and, 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 and very public recognition of officers at combined authority working with uh, officers in the constituent authority. And indeed, Steve, as you say, members, you know, you know representatives, no, because I, you know, ultimately how we spend this money and making sure it gets spent is I, I will get challenged on, you know, because or indeed the combined authority will get challenged on. But, you know, we also need to have a, a, a buy in that, you know, the aspirations that are in different areas and there will be different expectations, depending literally on the rurality, but how that then links in with what we're trying to achieve together, be it in this case, East Cambridge and District on the combined authority. So um, it, this is more a play to kind of ensure that we're, we're doing it as a collaboration and making sure that we're aligned along the right lines uh, than, a, than a criticism per se of any project. Um, I mean, having had the chance to kind of express that in the public domain, obviously, uh, you know, come back to Louisa and help you get a steer on a, on a personal level, but also I appreciate other board members have made some very good points and submissions to this discussion. Um, it feels that, we, we, that there's a room there for us to go forward together and just make sure we deliver, yeah, and, and I guess justify what the role is for business in the local area and indeed the business board, be it a small scale as kind of Vic alluded to, or is actually to enhance it for the better delivery. Thank you. Uh, I guess there's also that wider view as, as to how the combined authority deals with fragmentation of funding, uh, which the, the SPF is certainly doing uh, across not, not every region uh, in, in that sense, and how that gets tied back to economic strategies and making sure that businesses, for example, in one area say, well, why aren't we getting rural grants when they're getting rural grants and, and, and those sorts of aspects uh, on that. Uh, are we uh, comfortable with, with, with noting the, uh, our, the board members' uh, comments uh, in the minutes and passing that through to uh, the uh, interim chair when they uh, attend the CPCA board meeting? Is that uh, appropriate? Uh, and to uh, see if there are any uh, objections from, from members for the uh, the recommendation, recommendations one to three, and there is a recommendation of five, which uh, I don't think you, you may have seen. Uh, so I'll read that out. Uh, as the accountable body, the combined authority shall ratify all grant funding decisions made by the four district authority panels, 
which shall include a combined authority officer with regards to rural England prosperity funds and that all payments will be retrospectively paid by the combined authority to successful grant applicants on receipt of valid evidence of payments being made and checked being completed by the district authorities. So that is the the, the fifth point and, and fourth uh, point to be a recommendation, to be recommended, rec recommended, get your words straight. Uh, so do I have any objections to those uh, recommendations, which again are just on the principle of the, the process, not the projects themselves? Good. Uh, thank you. That can be therefore carried unanimously. Uh, so we move on to uh, item 3.5, which is the Strategic Funding Management Review. And it's Steve Clark again. Who yes. will present. Hello, sorry, it's me again. Um, so this, this report is the regular update on the strategic funding programmes that the business board gets. Um, I'm going to take it as read that you've all read the report. Um, so, um, so as this is just an update report with no decisions at this time, I'm going to highlight only a few of the points contained within it. So um, at 2.2, so the current spend on live projects, um, we, as the board requested last meeting, we've added um, a, a column to that um, table that's tracking the current live projects, um, which shows um, how that project project is delivering, whether it's on track or whether there are comments. Um, and I would draw your attention to the College of West Anglia Net Zero project, um, which currently, uh, as reported last meeting, was um, uh, was bringing forward a project change request, um, having not been successful in securing levelling up funding through the Fenland bid. Um, so we're now expecting that change request to come through in September, um, and the the college, uh, the business board has awarded two million towards that project, and the college of um, are working with a private sector partner to um, backfill some of that funding that that's not been secured through the leveling up, um, and they are working with design consultants uh, and quantity survey to um, bring forward a different build specification, slightly smaller but with significantly cost reductions using a modular build. Um, and the project, sorry, the project change request, as I say, will come forward for September, wasn't in time for this board. So, um, and then the other project I was going to draw your attention to on the um, project delivery table is the Ramsey Produce Hub. Um, there's a slight delay there because there was some sorting out around lease arrangements for the building, but that's been done. So, um, and there's also, they're just waiting for their shared prosperity fund agreement to come into play and that project will commence. So it's a slight delay, but it's still um, uh, a, a green go project. Um, and, um, and then just to jump to another point about monitoring, as we gather our data from projects now on a quarterly basis, we reported in the last meeting, um, we don't have an update in this paper, so we will bring to you in September a, like we always do, a full tally uh, appendix of the monitoring uh, and update all those figures. Um, the business gross service independent um, evaluation was slightly delayed, so it's not appended to this paper, but the board members have all seen it because we've shared it, as um, the chair had mentioned at the beginning. Um, so uh, yeah, so you've all got that for comments and review. Um, and then the other one I was, the final thing I was gonna draw your attention to is we're still um, no news on the um, UK research and innovation launch pad. So at 2.8 in the paper, sorry, um, we've heard from the government that they're now not gonna make an announcement um, until the summer. So whatever that means. Um, and of course, currently, the combined authority is invested in two expressions of interest, um, uh, one on manufacturing and one on agri-tech. So we'll see what happens there. Um, obviously happy to take any questions on anything else in the paper. Uh, one from me, I was just wondering in terms of the, uh, can you say something about the Create Growth Fund and mm. uh, how that's being sort of uh, managed and pushed forward? 
Yeah, so the Create Growth Fund is a partnership um, uh, led by the universities in Suffolk, Norfolk and Cambridgeshire. So it's Anglia Ruskin in Cambridgeshire and um, and the two LEPs, if you like. So the Combined Authority and then the New Anglia LEP. Um, this was a combined bid we put in. This is to help um, uh, creative businesses um, through their cohorts of creative businesses go through a developing and um, preparing so they process so they can make applications for funding to funding uh, to central funding from government or to other types of funding. So um, it's being delivered in cohorts in the various locations. And um, the first cohort was kicked off in Norfolk, Suffolk. That's progressing. Um, and I think we're cohort three and four, I believe, one in Peterborough, one in Cambridge. Um, which will be later this year. So, um, yeah, and we we are. I mean, obviously, we were just um, a supportive bidder to securing this. The delivery is actually being led by those universities. And so, will those universities be delivering the uh, the support for the the companies and identifying the companies? They are, yes. Um, there's been marketing in each of those areas and they are, um, I think I shared before the um, the website link and I think there was yeah. some promotional um, material. Uh, so yes, they're doing the um, the markets out and I believe all the um, uh, companies and sector cluster bodies that are involved in the creative sector have all been, uh, there was a big launch event in Norwich, they were all brought together. So I think there's a, there's a definite networked um, uh, promotional effect to to develop the cohorts. I'm just a little bit concerned that we don't really have as, as strong a creative sector group within uh, Cambridgeshire, maybe slightly different to in Peterborough, but it's sort of a bit of a lacking area in terms of the, the maybe the sector strategies and, and that, that cohort. So I wanted to make sure that we, we don't lose the opportunity of that and maybe using this uh, cohort driven thing I know it's not till September but uh, as a uh, almost like a focus for, for bringing to get people together on this side yes I absolutely agree and um, so through the through some of the work that um, uh, Domenico has been doing on the market towns too some of those creative organizations and bodies are very much involved um, in this as much as they are in other work so we have been bringing some of those folks together um, well it I just think it could be sort of linked into some of the creative quarter development plans that are being discussed uh, in Cambridge, because again, it could, it's a relatively small funds this, but it, it creates that momentum of interest in terms of the creative sector. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Nick? I seem to be saying a lot today, I'm getting into a bad habit, but uh, I, I, for reassurance, um, and obviously Steve, thanks for presenting this, Good news and, and highlighting it, uh, Michael. Um, you know, a mayoral priority has always been, even before as before I was campaigning to be as a mayor, was a, a cultural strategy for the whole of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, uh, and it is something that I'm on record. I mean, I, as far back, you know, the the, the idea of, of kind of it was a bit of a uh, early optimism that you know we could have a a city of culture type bid or a county of culture mm -hmm. bid in the future now i i appreciate that my ceo or our ceo rob bridge is on the call and it's again it's just a kind of reassurance of one of the challenges that you know i've set myself as well as the organization is that bring a cultural strategy to sort of the combined authority and i i i appreciate your point you make mike it's not something that is sort of necessarily covered within the business board in terms of representation. And there have been occasions where I've said, look, uh, you know, in terms of recruitment for the future board, there are people out there um, who, who could maybe be very helpful in coming to the business board, but as well as kind of helping us with developing and putting on into paper a formalized cultural strategy, which works again across all the combined authorities. I'm very mindful that there are examples where people are already saying, because it's been out there in the public domain, be it a district council level, when cultural asks, be it, you know, speaking to, you know, national bodies, you know, Heritage England, you know, we could be doing a lot more pulling these things together. So 
uh, I can see a lot of nods of approval, but it's just to kind of reiterate, it's certainly something I feel very strongly about. I'd certainly look for the sort of support of the uh, of the business board to say that this is something that we can also see. Maybe not, we don't have the expertise at the moment, but it's something for our uh, board. Uh, and it's a sort of a challenge to the combined authority, hopefully to kind of move forward with it. Uh, thanks, Nick. And it's obviously there's the cultural side, but it's also the get the whole games industry, which is uh, yeah. obviously very strong, and where that sits within the uh, the digital, uh, or whether it sits separately. Now, I think the uh, Mike just on that point there, I think gaming definitely sits within the creative sector as the definition these guys use. So, yeah. Uh, well, a large chunk of the the national gaming uh, industry sits in Cambridge, but it's not really represented very well. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, this is uh, just for recommendation uh, and almost so just noting it, I think. So we're just noting it uh, as a report. So uh, if there's uh, duly noted, if there's no more comments. Uh, item 3.6 is the Growth Works Management Update for quarter nine. It's Steve Clark. <laughs> yeah, you just can't get rid of me. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'll start off by saying um, Nigel Parkinson sends his apologies. He would normally attend as the Growth Co uh, chair on this item. And, and obviously Growth Co is the subsidiary that holds the contract with Growth Works. Um, so basically, this is just an update paper for the um, uh, quarter nine performance. It's retrospective, obviously. Um, this is reflecting the quarter up to the end of March and obviously time's moved on. We'll be bringing you next time the more up to date as we go. Quarters and two monthly meetings don't always pan out. Um, so uh, as the board already knows, there's four key strands of service within the growth works and this report um, uh, sets out a bit of detail uh, and performance um, commentary around those. Um, the GrowthWorks programme, as we've already heard, um, comes to an end at the end of December this year. So we are now moving into what are the last few quarters of the programme. Um, the table at 3.1 in the paper shows the actual summary overall for um, jobs um, uh, and apprenticeships and learning outcomes. These are the contractual measures within the contract that they have to deliver. Um, Obviously, um, there's some concern around the apprenticeship side, some concern around learning outcome side, because that's the, um, the part that's most underperforming. Although we are seeing there is an uptick in this quarter and there is um, significant uptick in some of the other reporting we're seeing now month by month. Um, so, uh, but performance um, generally overall from a jobs contractual point of view is very good. It's improved compared to where it was. Um, and as I say, that trajectory is, is continuing. Um, in terms of just general commentary, um, the, um, that last quarter, I say the, the trajectory is strong. Um, GrowthWorks added 797 jobs. So that was the strongest quarter that they've had today in the contract. Um, and um, the whole program total, um, is currently tracking at the end of April. So in this report, you see 3771 at the end of March. At the end of April, they were at 4102 jobs. So that continued trajectory is, is significantly good and it's 561 ahead of where they should be. Um, so obviously the program has taken quite a few steps when it, it was underperforming in year two, it's pivoted and adjusted. Um, but um, as I've already said, skills is still the one that we've got to watch and we're putting a lot of effort and emphasis on, although um, we're now looking at obviously what comes next beyond um, the service and, and how we um, work with that. The client survey. Oh, sorry, just one point. Did we ever change the top number? You know, we had this conversation at one point because of the issues around timing and stuff. Is the number still the same? Because I thought we said we we're going to leave it. And yeah, it was left. It was so left. left. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They weren't changed. That's right. We brought forward a change request, which yeah. you guys rightfully said you accept some bits, but not changing the numbers. And we left it. So that's okay. So these are still the same numbers. Yep. Still contractually okay. to the same targets. Yeah. Um, 
Sorry, so the client survey, the net promoter score for quarter nine was 48%, which in that particular system of scoring is classed as good. Um, but that is a decline from the last two quarters where it was considered to be very good and world class. Um, and if you look at the trend across the whole program, the average score across all quarters is currently running at 63%, which is still considered to be world class. Um, but obviously we're watching the level of um, customer satisfaction there because as we run towards the end of the program, it's quite likely that we may find we'll get more detractors um, in that as things like grant pots run out, there's not available. And so you get more and more folks who perhaps um, will pass comments on that. Um, so, uh, and just to note that GrowthWorks has engaged in terms of its wider efforts. So that's Growth Hub and all the streams of activity with 7,800 companies. That's per the CRM that um, they use, uh, which is our CRM um, that we can see. Um, so just a bit of headline from each one. Um, skills brokerage we currently predict is on track uh, for trajectory to hit the required 1705. Um, but we, we anticipate that the significant challenges in the apprenticeship numbers uh, is likely that that may slightly undershoot from the end. Um, in terms of European social funding, which is used to fund the skills side, we are seeing improvement in the metrics that are used there. Um, and we anticipate that achieving uh, the outputs, that's the CO23, so that's a training plan with a company, and R9s, which is that training plan delivered. So, um, so we're hoping to see that uh, achieved, and, and the trajectory of numbers suggest it will. Inward investment, um, obviously that's a very lean team, and they've done very well when you look at the numbers and the jobs. Um, the service line has had success across all district councils. But obviously you can see that Peterborough and Cambridge are slightly above all the rest. Um, and the inward in service line uh, has a healthy pipeline. Uh, at the end of quarter nine, it was 275 companies. I believe it's higher than that now. So we will be looking and working with them as to what happens with that pipeline as we move out of 23 into 24, because um, there's significant numbers of possible jobs. Now, uh, not all of those will land, but um, and then capital grants and equity. Um, the CapEx grants have gone well. We've given out more grants than we anticipated, um, and that pot is pretty much almost exhausted. But the equity investment side, as we talked about earlier on, that's still got um, significant money to invest. And whilst there's a significant amount of interest in their pipeline, um, currently um, the amount we're seeing come through and approve is, um, you know, not potentially not um, going up enough. So as was already mentioned, if that particular piece of funding is not deployed, we can look to um, pivot there or retain that funding for other use um, to support businesses or projects. Um, and then finally, the growth coaching, um, the project change request that was uh, approved by DLUC on ERDF, um, we are, we've seen um, significant um, upturn there in the take up of that. Um, and uh, that particular part of the funding stream, the ERDF grants, um, the window is closed at the end of June and we're just working through the final claims. Um, it's likely that um, we're going to be around 85% deployed um, on that particular um, funding stream. Um, and also similarly, um, like the other um, service lines, growth coaching had 110 growthing coaching completions. So businesses completing a coaching journey, a coaching plan, um, which again was the strongest month for that service line um, today in any of the quarters. So um, yeah, and just to note, I've already mentioned it, but the evaluation of growth works has obviously been shared with business board members currently. So I'll stop there um, and happily take any questions. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, one, for, well, two for me, actually. One is that the uh, 
uh, with the potential shortfalls on the ERDF and ESF funding, are we in any danger of uh, having to give any money back? Or, um, or no. So on the ESF, the current um, the current modelling of what's coming through the pipeline looks like it will achieve the outputs of the CO twenty threes, the R nines. Um, and so we won't below be below the 85%, which at which there is a risk um, from the awarding body to take any funding back. So we're we're quite confident there that that will be okay. On the ERDF side, because it's a pure grant scheme, there's very minimal admin uh, in that scheme to manage it. Um, we can't claim from DLUC um, anything that we've not already through the system and approved under a grant offer letter to a business. So, um, so there's no risk to us that we will be drawing down something that we then will have to give back. Um, we'll only be drawing down what we precisely spend in the final claim. Sure. Okay. Uh, and my second question was just that uh, in order for GrowthWorks to try and improve its situation from, from year two was to put a lot of money into marketing and brand awareness and, and all those aspects. And then we have the usual thing of then we got a few months until a cliff edge when that brand disappears. Uh, how do we see an overlap or providing some continuity to, to businesses in terms of what they see as the growth, uh, uh, sorry, business support? Yeah, um, so uh, no decisions yet about whether we, is the growth, all, all assets and IP from that program belong to the combined authority. So no decision yet whether we actually drop the GrowthWorks brand or whether we carry it on under that Team Cambridgeshire proposal. Um, but the other brand that exists in the marketplace is Growth Hub, which is embedded within that. And that actually has equally as much traction. So we need to decide which of those brands we use. Growth Hub is a government brand which you know, all localities have. And um, so we, we've yet to decide that. We will decide it as we move towards the end of December, what that looks like. Okay, thank you, Vic. Thank you. I, I'm gonna say my usual thing. I'm in awe of everybody here. It's a 140 page report <laughs> just on growth works. I can't possibly go through all those statistics that are shown and actually form a proper opinion on all this information that's been presented to us. Isn't there some way of getting them to be able to just tailor what they do? Because I've seen this report probably in four or five different um, guises now, um, and it's the same report sent to each organization. As a business board, we cannot possibly be expected to review a 140 page document with this much detail and information in it. And it means that we miss the important stuff. Or maybe I do and you're all on top of it. If so, my apologies, but I'm merely human. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, I'll, I'll come back. I, I, I have to admit, I mean, the um, I think this is one of the uh, the thoughts that we put a lot of service streams together under one programme. And actually what you've done is you've added, you know, four or five different reporting reports put together in one. Um, you know, almost each of the service lines would in, in normal world would probably be separate standalone programs and have their own report, um, et cetera. I mean, we've tried to simplify what are the contractual and that's the jobs, the apprenticeships and the learning outcomes is the main measure. I mean, obviously, there's significant intelligence and, and, and outputs built in all of this, particularly the growth coaching side, um, where there's all kinds of useful information, like what businesses are engaging them on, you know, what subject matter, what are the issues? Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've tried to work with the local authorities, distilling reports for those guys, how they want it. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I know of a, given the programs, you know, coming to an end, I'm not sure what more we can do to try and break this down to, um, but there is a lot of useful information there. Um, should we want to break it off and interrogate it? Uh, so we shouldn't send it to everyone and just send the summary because Vic, the summary tells us what we need to do, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. I, I mean, you, you know, the 140 pages, I don't know why we send it to everyone, but the summary is what we need to know here and the feedback, at some point from the guys who've used the service, which I think the districts could be quite vocal, but at least it tells us where we need to go. 
it can certainly be an appendix. And uh, it, to be honest with the growth works reports, there is another whole series of appendices as well that we don't see. So that's uh, so just get rid of them all. That. Just just leave the summary. I mean, if we did a board meeting, you'd only put your slides up. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you know what, Steve, I appreciate where you're coming from. And I think there's the desire to make sure we've got all the information, but actually that causes us not to have the information yeah. because it's too much. And I'm happy to be the one that takes the hit for not being clever enough to manage it. But really, this disguises so much and it means that we spend our time. The detail is just far beyond what any board should be considering and I'd love us to find a way where through the summary, you give a narrative around that because we then trust the officers to go through the yeah. detail. And if there are important things picked out of the summary, we'd be really grateful for them. But it's good because this was only a 200 and what was it? 78 page um, set of documents this time around, um, which is down from the nine, eight or 900 we normally get. So thank you for, for the progress. It's appreciated. Uh, sadly, it can also sometimes be a symptoms of a compliance driven uh, contractor. Yeah. Uh, just uh, as uh, because it's difficult sometimes to uh, separate out the uh, the ongoing report and then a review report that we've got on that side, which we're not really discussing now, but is that be scheduled in for time at the next uh, business board meeting? Yeah, I was I was going to suggest we do it at one of your informal board meetings because we haven't necessarily made that report public. Um, and obviously it's for us to digest what the evaluation says about the programme and potentially commentary about the contractor's performance and everything else. So I, I was going to suggest that um, if the board feel they would want it brought back and discussed in, in the public meeting, we can do that too. Uh, I, I... Personally, I don't really see a reason to do that, and I think the the uh, the, the pre meeting would be a good way of doing that. Uh, though there were some really good uh, economic indicators in there, which I uh, was less familiar with, which I think could be useful to be drawn out at some point. Uh, good. So again, this this uh, vast amount of information was just for note, or for those that did note it. And uh, I'm happy to sort of move on to uh, part four. I'm because Fliss kept quiet during that, and I, I, I was looking for the little hand to come up for, on that side. So, if we move to to item four point one, which is the employment and skills strategy implementation plan, I'm delighted to welcome Fliss Miller, the assistant director of skills. Brilliant, thank you, Chair, and also good afternoon, Board. I can't work out if I'm the finale as the last substantive item or, or pull the short straw. Um, anyway, I just wanted to update you as a Board on the uh, progress on the implementation of the employment and skills strategy that was uh, approved unanimously by the Combined Authority Board some 18 months ago, um, back in January 2022. Um, the, the strategy also came to the business board and you'll probably be familiar that we had four um, key themes or four pillars, which were in relation to pre-work learning and formal education, employer access to talent, life-wide and lifelong learning, and also, also support into and between work. So this update is not based on KPIs and metrics. That is something that we're looking to um, pull together um, once a year. This is really just showing progress and you'll be able to see in both the, the appendices on actions that have been taken um, as outlined both in the strategy and also implementation plan. So there are a number of um, actions that were identified, um, short-term priorities, but also some longer change projects. Within the body of the paper, you'll see some of the big achievements that we've taken forward and Within this academic year, I'm a skills person, so speaking academic terms rather than financial years, we've seen the opening of the campus for ARU Peterborough and also the North Cambridgeshire Training Centre. We secured um, lots more funding in terms of revenue for the Multiply programme, which is based around numeracy and also skills boot camps for Wave 4. Um, we've actually seen uh, bucking of the trend and we've seen more enrolments for the adult education budget against um, national average. Um, we've also seen success for implementation of the community renewal fund turning point project and that has informed 
um, our UK SPF projects going forward as well. We've totally turned around our careers contract with the CEC company and were um, chosen to be one of four trailblazers in the country um, for taking primary into um, careers into primary schools as well. We know there's still a lot more that needs to be done. One of the things that I'm really keen for our team to do is to have a more strategic focus on our commissioning. And so therefore we are starting to look at place-based approaches in terms of um, the need and also how we're commissioning. So against the employment skills strategy, I think we're making good progress. I think the actions are being taken forward how we would expect and hope. Um, but as always, it will all be around the metrics, see whether or not the interventions that we're taking forward are reflected in the metrics. Happy to take any comments. Thank you. Uh, Nitin. Liz, what's the measures? I mean, we've gone from one opposite to the other here. We talked about too many numbers on the one just gone, and we talked about nothing in terms of numbers in the on this one. So the reason why we haven't on this stage knitting is because figures are released on an annual basis. So they're released in November time. So therefore, but this do we have a trend? Election. I mean, I know it feels good, but what is the sort of real outcome of what we're targeting and how are we progressing? So there's a number of metrics, some that we have direct control over, such as the number of enrolments and achievements funded through the adult education budget but then if we look at the wider metrics across the whole of the combined authority area how many of our residents have no qualifications how many are qualified to level three and i suppose one of the things in my mind is the drive towards maths and science for older people how is that going i mean that'd be nice to know if that's the sort of thing that helps people to get work it's all right educating people and that's great but what are we educating them in so we have control, depends what levels you're looking at, Nitin. So therefore we have control over the adult education budget. It's a 12 million pound budget per year. Um, and then we have multiplied, which is numeracy based. But if you're looking at the higher level skills, that's not something as a combined authority we have control over. We work and influence with universities, but it's not something that we commission. So part of the um, employment skills strategy is looking at what we commission and the impact of what we commission and part of it is looking at how we as a system leader in the skills space engage in, engages with a number of our different partners and how we can make sure we make the best use of our funding so therefore we're working with public health with DWP working alongside the universities trying to make sure as a system we're using the funds that we have uh, in the most effective way. Uh, thanks, Liz. Uh, one question I was going to bring in on that was um, doing quite a bit of work with the universities where there's currently a far greater focus on enterprise development and developing those enterprise skills, both within current students, but also potentially graduates. Is that something that could potentially doesn't sit within your commissioning, but does that potentially sort of align with the, uh, the objectives? Yeah, I think so, because one of the things, and, and as Vic will, will say as well, that we've been doing as part of the work for the Local Skills Improvement Plan is 70% of our businesses in Cambridge and Peterborough are, are, are micro businesses. And so therefore, it's something that we need to make sure that people don't just fall into, but also train to take, take that forward. So, yeah, that's something that we're acutely aware of. Uh, and the second point I was going to make was something that uh, I know both you and I sort of uh, had a good go at growth works for in the early days was that lack of crossover and cross referral of uh, when you're talking to one company on the business support side of the coaching side where you can see skills uh, opportunities as well. Uh, how do you see that being integrated under a uh, internal team led business support? It's a good question. Um, it's something that Steve and I need to work on. So now that we have those four new posts, I think that's one of the things that we need to make sure that we're joining up the work on that, because in each of the sector strategies, there is a skills section within that. We've also done uh, undertaken more research into the skills required and future skills requirements as well. So it's something that we need to make sure that it's a holistic um, focus, I guess, in, in when taking things forward. So it's certainly work that we need to undertake as, as that team grows. 
good because I think it's certainly something which is just makes sense from a business perspective is to look at the, the two things uh, in a holistic way. Good. Uh, any other comments from uh, from members? Or oh, you're getting tired now. Good. Well, thank you very much, Fliss. Uh, again, this is a recommendation uh, to to note. So uh, I, we appreciate the report, and that is uh, noted. Um, and uh, you were the headline act. I think that's the way we described it, the last one on, on that side. So. Um, but item five is for uh, the business board headlines to the combined authority board. And I'm not quite sure what to put in there. So I I will, to a certain extent, rely on uh, our, our officers to uh, to bring together the, the key points uh, from the that have been covered from the, the minutes from, from the, the board today. Uh, I think there's been some very constructive discussions and some valued input to, in, in all the areas. But uh, Certainly, from, from my side, particular interest in terms of how things are going, in terms of some of the funding aspects and the um, the the way in which the the business support is being uh, realigned. Uh, looking at it from that side, it will be good for the uh, headline to be in terms of the progress towards appointing a, a new chair, uh, and also some of the areas that, that Richard uh, brought in, and the, uh, the I think the general. Uh, refocusing of the business board towards being in a more advisory capacity uh, for the combined authority and not just the sort of program board that type of thing so i think those to me were some of the uh headlines not necessarily in policy but just the fact in which the the way the business board members are interacting with the officers within this environment i think that's the way it's coming across uh, uh, to me uh the the last item is the business board forward plan which seems to go to about 2040, I think. It seemed to go a long way forward. It was a very good on that side. So I just wondered if any members have comments uh, on the uh, the forward plan. Uh, and hopefully we can schedule in that uh, combined meeting that we talked about to, uh, with the combined authority and the business board to, to look at some of those aspects uh, as well. Good. Uh, I think that that concludes uh, our business uh, for this afternoon. Uh, I, I thank you kindly and also appreciate all the input uh, from you. And I think that was a very valuable session. Uh, Nick. I was applauding you, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> Nothing more. Just want to say thank you for stepping up. Uh, interim you may have been, but it was uh, thankfully, thankfully for getting us through it all. It was uh, appreciated. All right, thank you very much. Okay, then, go and have a good afternoon. Thanks. Bye.